Hello everyone, welcome to the Welcome to the Class and Lecture 1. I will choose by my own decision to sign and talk at the same time. The reason why I'm doing that is it is one way to provide um, access to deaf people who take the course. It is not the best way. It is a way, and it is the quick solution I'm using until the time that I caption the video, and perhaps redo with full interpreting of what I'm saying. So, hello. And as you can see, this is a screen recording. We have a few things to review that you can use. I just want to let you know about where the PowerPoint can be found. All right, my website, which I am uh, not actively keeping up for the past three years, uh, but will eventually get back to tweaking and using more often. Right now, my efforts are on, uh, oh, I don't know, Troy University and developing lecture material and other things for, you get the idea. <coughs> so, you see, uh, up here, let's see if I can do this. Up here, we have hand in mind publishing, training, imagery, resources. So you click on that. Okay, and you say, but, 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 hang on. And you come down here. That's the book. Click on the book. Okay, so now you've got choices. Uh, those work. I should check to see if they have the answers in there. Um, I don't know. Let's see. So, quizzes. Wow. Okay, that's good material. That's where my quizzes come from. I've changed them. I've put them into Canton. I'm tired of ducking here. Uh, and so, great. Ex extra resources, use it, understand everything that's there. There's uh, other books than what we're using now, but uh, it's all good information if you can. Today, with Google and everyone has a computer, I have decided what's the point in memorization. The computer memorizes it for us. We need to remember how to get the information. That's essentially the same as memorizing was back in the day. So uh, that's that's where I am now and, and why I'm back to using multiple choice instead of using short answer because you, you should get feedback faster and know that anyway. PowerPoint. You click on the, click on the PowerPoint, and you'll get this. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna send that away now. Okay. So here's the PowerPoint, and that's where you find it. So now you know, and it's your own f fault. And if you don't remember what to do, just rewind the video. You know that. So this is Deaf History Notes, and you'd say, I thought this was Introduction to Interpreting. Mm -hmm. It's Deaf History Notes. And we'll add some interpreting introduction stuff along the way. But if you're going to interpret for the deaf community, you need to know the deaf community. You need to know the variety, the diversity in the deaf community. A lot of diversity in the deaf community, more than many people will tell you. And so here we go. So I'm going to make these bigger because uh, the pictures are in the book. It's the same pictures. I'm going to explain them. Okay, so we start off with the idea of what is communication. Communication is uh, one mind's understanding of what another mind has expressed. That expression may be on purpose, accidental, unconscious, and my 
perception of what you communicated might be accurate, wildly off the mark, okay, but that's communication, and we have mis, 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 communication. Uh, this picture is showing that animals communicate. You are an animal. Maybe somebody's told you that before, but uh, all people are in the group of animals. Animals communicate. Humans have an additional part of communication called language, and I, uh, we will discuss it later why it's limited to humans, not dolphins, not apes, uh, chimpanzees, uh, not other animals. People have language. There we go. That's the picture. Moving on. So, for communication to happen, you need to have a mind. Uh, and animals have minds, have brains, anyway. Uh, and so, what's happening in the mind related to communication? Well, you know about communication. I know it's possible to communicate. I know about things. I know about other people. You're not born with all this. You have to learn some of these things, okay? Uh, I know about my physical situation, and maybe that if it's dark, signing is not a good, clear communication. That if it's noisy, talking may be very hard. Um, and so I have my conscious intention for my communication. I want to inform you. I want to generate a lecture. And my unconscious uh, intent for communication, which if it's truly unconscious, I don't know and I can't express it, but maybe my unconscious uh, goal is that more people know how to communicate because I have three deaf kids and two deaf grandchildren, and I want them to communicate with the world. Well, um, but I just told you that, so that's not truly an unconscious uh, intention because that's up in the front of my brain. Next slide. To communicate, how do we do it? We have to express it. It has to be expressed in some way. Many different ways to express communication. Okay, not necessarily language. Language is a subset of communication. So we start with the big picture and then we narrow it down to language all later, not today. So there's the mind, right? Right over there. That bowling ball, that's the mind, okay? And then this coming out of it, that's expressive communication. That's the picture. Okay? And what's possible? Hang on. So, I can speak, I can make noise, I can, you know, that, I don't know what that communicates, but it's possible that I'm communicating by making noise. I can um, make some kind of image, and that's an image too. It was a sign that I wasn't actually making noise. Uh, tactile, which I can't uh, simulate here because I can't touch you uh, through the computer, but uh, if you had a, uh, a phone and you're playing a game and it vibrates uh, when something explodes, fine. That's um, potential communication. And then I have left two other things that we're going to just jam together. Uh, taste and smell. They are related to each other. They are different senses, um, but they kind of go together in many ways. So I can hear things, but I have to express sound. I can see things, but I have to have seen some kind of expressed image. I can feel things, but I need to have some kind of texture or um, vibration vibration and I can uh, taste or smell things okay moving on and so I can perceive these things through my ears through my eyes through skin or you know, skin really um, uh, through tongue through smell get it and notice same bowling ball, different cone, right? Let's go back, right? There's the expression. Here's the perception, 
right, from my mind to you, from the world to my mind, and you're in the world. Okay. And communication happens in situations. Many times, both minds are in the same room. Lately, uh, both minds are in different rooms, and we have uh, other pictures for that in other books, but not this one. Uh, but you get the idea that this mind expresses, and this mind perceives, and then this mind can express, and then this mind perceives, these are the official sounds, those are, those are the linguistic terms. Okay. <clears throat> hey, looky there. Uh, I've got this lined up here. Okay. Let's get it centered. So, I can express and perceive different modalities, a mode of communication. Modes are based on perception and expression. So, I can see image, I can hear sound, I can touch or feel texture or vibration. So, drawings are an example of communication. Uh, cartoon figures, uh, maybe looks just like the person's sketch, looks like a picture, right? Um, maybe uh, an etching, <laughs> marking something. <laughs> what do the three mean? It means they've killed three people. Oh, sorry I asked. Uh, an arrow, like which way are we running? Going that way. Okay, fine. Uh, or a printed word. Hey, there. Look at that. It says... Well, I can't highlight it. Ah! Where, where, where did that come from? Okay, so printed words are image, but that happens to also be language. Okay. Sound. I can make a noise. Right? Uh, so I can scream, or I can say words like I've been doing for about a few minutes now. Um, we have me mechanical sounds, which are like a... That... Uh, or doors, or whatever. You know, there's all kinds of sound in the world. Uh, I can also have Morse code tones. Which means SOS, which means save our ship, which was not in use before the Titanic sank and became widespread after that because they had different codes and they didn't know which one meant. Help! Okay. Uh, and then I can touch or feel things. So I can, you know, touch objects. Um, or uh, maybe a fence is an object, and I can feel a fence, especially if it's an electric one. Uh, sculptures, okay. Um, 3D markings. I'm thinking if you're blind, what could you feel that's of relevance to you? Uh, a 3D arrow on a sign. Oop. Oh, that way. Okay. Or brailled words. I could feel that too. So I have language that can be expressed through these things and other kinds of communication. That's my point. I want you, I want you to remember for the rest of your life as a professional interpreter or someone working with deaf people that communication is much bigger than just a little bit of language. Uh, language is very important, language is very complex and technical. But if you want to say hello, well, how do I say hi? I don't know. Wave, smile. Those would be good things to do. Thumbs up in some cultures. Um, okay. You already know how to say yes and hi and no and whatever. You, you have a, about a hundred gestures that you already know. You don't need my help for that. You need to remember that you can use them. Oops. Let's try that again. <clears throat> now we tie it to language. This is different. This is different. This is different. We have modality, sound, image, texture, and we have channel. And the channels can use any modality. There's normally that's associated one to one, but it's not the same. A modality is for communication purposes, and it's related to senses, sense of smell, taste hearing, sight, and touch. 
uh, and our ability to uh, what is perceived as uh, sounds, textures. Okay, those are modalities. There are three language channels. There are three language channels. Let me just tell you something. There are three language channels. See the three? There are three language channels. Written, signed, spoken. That's it. There are no other language channels, and they overlap in different ways with modalities. Channels are not modalities. But they're related, so it's going to get confusing. Okay, so I have a written language. There, see? Right there, it says written language. I can type symbols, like right there on the PowerPoint. I could use the Morse code image. I could use flashing lights. I could have dots and dashes on a page. Those are both different kinds of images. I can express a written language through sound. I could S-P-E-L-L-A-L-O-U-D. Okay, I could use Morse code tones to express a written language. I can use Braille texture to express a written language. I could use raised letters that you can feel. A, B, C. Okay, those are all written language, different modalities. Understand the idea? Oh, please tell me that you understand. Okay, we're going to move on to signed languages. We have only two. I can use image by signing. I can use feeling. I can use feeling by uh, tactily signing to another person that they sign into their hand. And of course, if I can see, they don't have to sign into my hand. I just see them signing. And then they, uh, and then they, oh, 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 back and forth, right? That's tactile signing. They're not perceiving it by image. They are perceiving it by feeling. Now, yes, people make noise when they sign. Sometimes it's vocal noise, and sometimes it's <coughs> percussive uh, noises when hands hit things. That's not enough information to express language. It might communicate, but it's not language. It's not enough information because there's too much missing. It's, it's, okay, so there's no sound-related modality for signed languages. That's why it's blank in the middle. Okay. Now, spoken languages. There we go. Spoken languages. Um, I can speak and make noise. Right. That would be over here, right? That's the normal way that we use spoken language. But I can transcribe speech sounds. I can show them with cues. So I can cue my speech sounds, and if you know how to read cues, then you can understand. So if you can understand cues, you can understand me. If you don't understand cues, what did you just do? I saw it, but I don't know what it means, right? If it's still visual, it was still there, but maybe you don't know what it means. And then Tadoma, which uh, is looks bizarre and, and works a little bit, um, but the idea is that you're feeling spoken language. So we start with, if I remember right, so the thumb is over the lips, the index finger is over the, at, the, at the nose, so mm, mm, uh, sounds can be perceived. Uh, this is going to catch p uh, p puffs of, of air. This will look at the jawline. I don't know that that helps much for me. Uh, and then vocal cord movement with the pinky. So every finger has something to feel. It's very vague, very hard, and I'm uh, people tell me that, or actually I've read, that uh, a lot of practice with specific people means that some routine things can, you, you can understand them through Tadoma. Good luck otherwise. Uh, tactile cues. So, right? So if you have the Tadoma and you have the other hand on the cueing, so, hello, how are you? Um, possible that uh, you could express a spoken language through texture not through written 
or um, symbols, but you get the idea. So there's your mix match of three language channels and three expressive and perceptive modalities. We're not including smell and taste. Why? Because it's really, really very hard to express language through smell or through taste. I can ex express that I love you because I've cooked this wonderful meal for you and you, you understand that I love you. Um, but I would have a hard time saying, please go down uh, to the store and buy more uh, meat because we're almost out through making a soup. Unless the soup has no meat, I suppose maybe I can communicate that. Let's move on. Yes. So, sign languages. Very important to the deaf community. Would you say? Yes, I think that's a good idea. Okay, good. <coughs> Where does ASL, American Sign Language, uh, ASL, where does it come from? It has its history, its beginnings, its roots from French sign language. And we're going to explore that a little bit more. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, so, let me check the book here. Because uh, you, you can just read the book. You know you need to read the book. I'm not going to explain everything in the book. All right. So what do we got? Um, we got what I just talked about. Okay. So it's time to explore this. All right. Let's bring this back. All right. Um, I'm going to use this to help show some things. So we need to start back in the 1700s. And... Um, you understand that you have a lot of history and deaf people are not getting a good education until the 1700s, uh, 1760s thereabout and we have this person uh, the Abbe de Lepe Charles Charles Michel de Lepe Le Pay means um, like a like a fencing uh, sword, um, and so his sign name was huh, right Le Pay. Okay, there he is, there he is, uh, Charles de Le Pay. So the story is that one night he's walking around the streets of Paris and he sees in the window, uh, a candle, and um, two women sewing. And he's preaching, you know, how to get saved, and he needs to preach to everyone, and I don't know. He, so he knocks at the door, and no one answers. But he knows that they're there. <clears throat> so he breaks and enters into the house. He had to, right? I mean, they, they were deaf. And so, I, for whatever reason, he finds, oh, there's two deaf, and they're okay. So he figures out he's going to gesture with them, sign a little bit. And he starts to learn sign language from the two of them. Now, why they didn't kick him out and call the police, I don't understand. But that's the story, and so that's the beginning. So he learns his sign language, not from a book, although he will write one. Uh, he starts by learning from people. You need to learn sign language from people. You need to meet deaf people. If you can't meet deaf people, then I will ask you, why are you studying this? Why are you involved? You know, oh, sign language is so beautiful. Well, that's true. So? I mean, people use the language. You need to know the people who use the language to really understand the culture, the depths of the meaning, the possibilities. Uh, so if you don't know any deaf people, you need to get yourself involved in the deaf community quickly if you're going to be in an interpreter training program. It does not do you good to be separated from the deaf community. Oh, but we're not supposed to. Oh, I don't care. Deaf community is interacting with video phones and other different ways to, to share information. You can get involved. Start with the website. Go to the National Association of the Deaf. 
go to the your state here Association of the Deaf. So Alabama Association of the Deaf, Maryland Association of the Deaf. Um, I think it's uh, Pennsylvania Pennsylvania Society for the Advancement of the Deaf PSA. Um, so most of them are associations of the deaf because they're under the National Association of the Deaf. The NAD, not MAD, NAD. They spell it out, you sound it. So you're talking about the NAD, the AAD, not the AD or the MAD. You'll figure that out later. There we go. So we're back to Charles Michel Lepe. He starts a school. Why is that important? Because before you had two sisters, they happened to know each other. They were deaf. They lived in the same house. Oh, you're deaf. I'm deaf. We should probably sign to each other. Okay, that's easy. What about other deaf people? Oh, deaf person on this street. Deaf person, you know, 10 streets away, never meets this person. They don't know they exist. They never communicate. They don't develop communication. They don't sign. They, they're isolated. All okay. right. School. Deaf, come. Deaf, come. Deaf, come. And you got all these deaf people together. It's like, wow, we should probably sign with each other. Huh, good idea, good idea. Hey, hey, look at this. Wow, language. Okay, that's the importance of Charles Michel de Lepe. Sets up a school. Gathering. People gathered, communicate, and... That was a nuclear bomb. Language begins. Okay. And then he dies. Eventually, he, he dies. And so we go to, should be in here, I should be able to just click on it. No, 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 no. Where's C card? Whatever, okay. So I'm going to go to C card. Rochelle Brazon, this guy. There, C card. He learns how to teach deaf from Le, Le Pe. They teach sign language, learn, 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 one, two, three years, whatever. Goes, sets up school, uh, and then he teaches deaf men have six, I think, six deaf uh, siblings, brothers and sisters. So he's youngest. He grows up in a family that's signing. This is very important. He grows up from an infant using language. He has full capability of the language and its potential. Right, These other kids who come to school, and some of them kids, are coming at age 12, 13, 18. Right? They're not kids, uh, but they're coming to learn because... And so they go and they learn. They will have problems for the rest of their life because they're not learning language early enough. And we will explore that in another course called Discourse Analysis 2, or Language Acquisition in the Deaf Community. So, point being that... Uh, this other person, this deaf person, who's known as um, Masio. Uh, that's not what I wanted. Um, Jean Massieu. Right, there he was. Um, now, there's, there's no picture of him, unfortunately. Uh, so, here we go. Jean Massieu deaf guy, learn with Sikad, hearing guy, uh, and move to Paris when the school needs a new leader because the founder has died, Lepe is dead, Sikad and Massieu, 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 um, come, and Massieu teaches the deaf kids, he's the first deaf person to teach deaf people. This is also important, because he's a native model of the language. Teaching new brains, new kids, hungry for a language. Right, they will use it amongst themselves. He's not the only one using it with them. But he's that model, he's that native model of language. He's also a role model. Hey, deaf, grow up, become what? Oh, I could become a teacher. That guy's deaf. I could do that. Okay. And there's one other person who does that. And that person is named Laurent Claire. It's French. So it's Claire 
yeah, it has a C at the end, but you don't say the C. It's just like Claire. Okay? Laurel Claire. Now we do have a picture of him. That's Claire. Uh, Laurent Claire, he sees this motto of sign language growing up in Sicard's management of the school, right? Matthew, Matthew is teaching. So deaf teaches to deaf kid grows up, he becomes teacher of deaf too. And this guy is teaching at the Paris school and has just found out that his plans to go and teach in Russia have been shot. They hired the hearing person in the team and said we can't afford two, so we we'll keep the hearing, get rid of the deaf guy. He was the deaf guy. Oh, not so smart. They should have kept the deaf person, get rid of the hearing person. But So he's available for hire, available for service. And then one more, one more piece to this picture, and you're saying, where is this going? It's all relevant. And read the book. Read, read, read the book. Seriously, read the book. Okay, and so we got um, um, Gallaudet. Um, Thomas Hopkins. And it just goes right to Gallaudet because there's not a lot of Thomas Hopkins out there. There's Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet. And you say, wow, what a good looking guy. Okay, and so, so he goes from America, from Connecticut. He goes to, well, he goes he to a lot of places. He goes to England for a long time, for almost a year, waiting to learn their system. But they want money. It's like the McDonald's of deaf education. And so you have to sign the contract, and you agree that you're going to pay fees. We're going to open up a branch in the U.S., and you're going to pay. And it's like, we're looking to, we don't want to charge a lot of money. We, this is not a business. We want to educate kids, deaf kids. Uh, I got sent here because uh, there's a little girl who's deaf and her dad's a doctor and he got all these people together and they gathered money and they sent me here to learn, okay, and he's not getting anywhere in England and he says, fine, I don't know what to do. And at the same time, Napoleon, the other the other guy with the pocket, is it Monsieur and Napoleon? Okay. Um, so Napoleon is uh, taking, you know, uh, taking over Europe again, right? This is 1816, uh, 1815, 1816. This is um, the um, reason that the British government was stealing American people from their boats and forcing them to work for the, uh, the Navy, the Navy, the Navy uh, for England. And that started the uh, War of 1812, which goes until 1815. And so that has just finished when he's in England. So he's not, the, the, the English are not too happy with him. Um, he's not too happy to be in England, probably. And Napoleon is still running around there. And it's not safe for people leaving a deaf school in Paris to be in Paris right now. So they're visiting in London. And so he, Gallaudet, uh, sign is based on his glasses. Uh, Gallaudet sees the show with Sicard, Massieu, Claire, and one other, and I cannot find anywhere in history who this other person was that was on this tour. But So they're all deaf ex except Sicard. And it's the show. It's like, look at these wonderful deaf people. They have learned. Ask them anything you want. And just to prove it. I'm not going to interpret their signs back to what they said, because I could make it all up. No, no, no. Uh, I will, um, uh, I don't know if you interpret anything. So you write the question down in French or in English, I think, and they will respond in writing. So they were asking questions about what is the nature of man, or I don't know. And they were like, responding like, oh, wow, it's so amazing that a deaf person has a brain and can answer these questions. Wow. Okay, so for whatever reason, it was this interesting show that, you know, look at the capability. Well, this got Gallaudet's attention. He was like, this is what I've been wasting my time for eight months trying to learn from these other people. Can I learn from you? Yeah, just uh, we got to wait for Napoleon to stop horsing around, and maybe it'll be safe, but uh, maybe one month, two months, we can 
and it happened. But a few months later, he goes to Paris, says, "This is perfect. I wish I had, I wish I had been here all this time. I'm out of money. I can't stay. I gotta go. Could one of you come with me and help me, you know, set up the school?" And Claire says, "Well, I was planning on going to Russia, but I'm available now. You really want me? Fine. Three years. I go. We'll see what happens." And of course, he stayed way more than three years. He married, had children, family, and died in Connecticut. Think that Claire, Claire, not uh, Claire, came back to France one time, I think. So that's how we get this French guy in Connecticut in the year 1817. Look at that. We're back to the book. Okay, right there. 1817. 18. Minus 1 is 17, right? It's not 1917. That was a movie. Okay, 1817. Okay, it's not 1717. We weren't a country yet. you got to set up the country, and then before you can do this too many times, we have 1817. New language, born in Connecticut on April 15. Now we know that as tax day. But April 15, 1817, new school, open up. Guess what? It's a secret code in your book. Count how many triangles there are. You will see that there are 18 blue ones and 17 red ones. And blue is alphabetically before red. So B, 18, R, 17, 1817. It's right there. Huh. Who knew? So that's the American School for the Deaf. Hang on. What are all these little squigglies and lines here? The point is that, all right, Lepe, the first guy I was talking about, sets up the school. And this other French person comes and learns and sets up another school in France. And other people from other countries come to Paris, learn, and set up their schools in other countries. In Sweden, in, um, um, not, no, maybe Bulgaria, I don't know, uh, in uh, Belgium, in, um, in other countries. And so what we see happen is that most of the European sign languages share a lot of overlap with French sign language, and still today there's a lot of overlap. No one is 100% the same. Each one is a little bit different. And it's different because their deaf people have their natural gestures, their beginnings of a sign language before the school started. But that's the idea. You set up a school, deaf kids come all together, and a language is born and grows. Okay, so we come to America. And we have ASL, American Sign Language, from French Sign Language. And other people learn from the Connecticut school and go and set up other schools in New York, in Pennsylvania, in Kentucky, in uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, in every state. Uh, most of the people who set up those schools either graduated themselves from the American School for the Deaf, which is what it's called now. Uh, or they went and they learned there, and then they came back. And that is the family of sign languages, that ASL is in a European family of sign languages. Uh, the variations in California and Connecticut and Texas and other states is dissolving now because we have radio phones and regional variations are, are reducing now. But the language is, has a history, has a long history, in fact, more than uh, 200 years of history now. And there are chapters 1 and 2, boom, all in one massively long um, lecture. Sorry about that. And just wait, there's more coming. See you on the next one.